this doesn't feel real. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to my channel. My name is Brittany Jade and in today's video I am going to be doing a recap of my five years in recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction. If this is the first video that you have ever seen of mine, if you've just landed on my channel by random chance, welcome and I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Brittany Jade. I am 31 years old. I am a mom of three and I am currently a stay-at-home mom. I run a small Etsy business and here on my channel I focus a lot on motherhood, lifestyle content, uh, wellness, postpartum fitness journey, as well as productivity tips for a mom who works from home or has a small business. So if any of that interests you, I really hope that you would consider sticking around by hitting that subscribe button and joining the family. I would love to have you. And yeah, let's go ahead and get on into today's video. My recovery date is November 26, 2015. And today is November 25th, 2020. So it's Wednesday. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day which I will have five years clean and sober. I am so taken aback and all day today I've been getting really emotional because tomorrow is also my daughter Nova Lee's fourth birthday. If you have not heard my entire addiction and recovery story, I did make a pretty lengthy video which explains in detail my history, what got me to the point of recovery and a lot of these stories about how I met my husband and details on my children and how they're intertwined with my story. So make sure that you check that video out. I will have that linked down below in the description box as well as somewhere it will flash up here. It would be probably a little bit helpful if you heard my full backstory. For this particular video, I wanted to focus on what I've learned in these last five years, what I can hope to apply to future so that I can remain in this state of sobriety. And I also asked my friends over on my Instagram to ask me questions that they had about in recovery because now my life in recovery is focused more on how I can help someone else overcome their trials and triumphs in life. And that is really where my heart and passion lies in this is to just be a source of support and be able to uplift another woman or another person who may be struggling with this or may have a family member who's struggling with this and just doesn't know how to show up for them. I hope that this space can provide some transparency so that you get a vulnerable in-depth look at someone who struggled with something so intimate and personal and in reality it can be very deeply shameful. I have had to work incredibly hard through a lot of the past guilt and shame that I had surrounding my addiction and in talking about it fairly openly with people from all walks of life, I have found a sense of freedom in sharing. You know, we do recover, thank God. And I am a living testament of recovery and that the program does work and with God and with true grit and working very hard every single day. I had the opportunity to change my life and I wouldn't change that or take that back for anything in this world. You couldn't have told me five years ago today. If you would have told me five years ago today that I would be sitting here making this video, living the life that I live with the family that I have, with the support system that I have, with everything I've been blessed with today, I would have literally laughed in your face because the life I have right now was so far out of reach then, five years ago, I would have never thought any of this would be possible and it's not for anything else other than recovery, turning my will and my life over to God as I understood him and fighting every single day for my sober date. Just a little bit about my background. I was a chronic abuser of substances from a very early age. My first drug of choice, as I like to say, it was definitely food. I had developed unhealthy coping mechanisms towards food. And basically, addiction stems from having unhealthy coping mechanisms and reaching for something to fill an empty void. Um, and for me, that void came from childhood traumas, childhood abuse, um, feelings of worthlessness, uh, low self-esteem, being an overweight child, accumulation of all of these things happening to me at a very early age. 
age is definitely what played a huge role into my wanting to fill this God-shaped hole that no amount of drugs, alcohol, food, sex, relationships, none of that could fill it, but you better bet your last dollar that I tried all of it to an excess in attempts to make myself feel whole and feel like I was worthy. And I am so grateful that I know now my worth is in God and I know that I am loved and that I am worthy and that I am important and I am special and I am uniquely made and I don't have to sit here and question whether or not I am a good human being today because I put my best foot forth every single day. I make my apologies and make my amends when I need to so that I can get them off of my heart and out of my head and I just try my best to be the best person that I can be. So I did ask my friends over on Instagram to ask me some questions so I would really like to start off with that because that will kind of give me a little bit more of where I should take this conversation. I'm doing this while my son is napping and my daughter is getting just a little bit of screen time so that I can record this really quickly. I'm already seven minutes in so I'm gonna try and make this as brief as possible with giving you as much context and value as possible. First First question is, does that mean you will never drink again or is it something you learn to manage? So uh, for me, my main drug of choice was opiates and you would know that if you know anything about me or if you've watched the video where I talked in depth about my addictions. Uh, I did not go into treatment facilities because I had a problem particularly with alcohol. However, I am the kind of alcoholic that I drink to excess and I drink to blackout. I don't drink for socializing. I use drugs and alcohol in excess to totally mute things out completely. So for me and my personal preferences, I choose to live a life free of any and all mood altering substances and I know that this can be different for different people and I do know some people who are in recovery from drugs who can still drink wine and alcohol and I think that that's a personal preference but for me personally and my lifestyle and the life that I live with my husband who is also in recovery we have chosen to live completely drug and alcohol free. And we also are very transparent with our provide our healthcare providers. They know about our past addictions. So um, we are very open and transparent about that so that we are not given anything from a doctor that could be potentially um, bad for us, essentially. Second question is, how do you ask or inquire about relapse without seeming confrontational? And I'm assuming that this question means how would you go about asking a family member or a friend if they had relapsed without starting a fight? And for me, I know that when someone would ask me that, if I had relapsed or if I was currently using, a fight would ensue no matter how they asked me because when you are in addiction, like I said in the beginning, it does bring up a lot of feelings of shame and guilt. So if somebody can see that on you, it's like instant, you have to protect yourself and go into defense mode. And honestly, I think that just if you have a gut feeling or if you're concerned, just voice those concerns. I mean, because like I said, however they would have come up for me if someone had asked me whether or not they had been kind and caring or they had asked in a joking way or they had asked in a rude way or in a, you know, in a kind way. If I were using, I would have still reacted in a volatile way or in a very upset way or in a defensive way. Um, so from my own personal experience, I think that when people would ask me if I had been using and I was using, my reaction would just be a dead giveaway. Um, and I know that everyone is different on this, but I don't think that there is a proper way to ask. Like I don't think there's like a soft and gentle way or like a upfront and personal and kind of just tell me right now, are you using, or are you loaded? Like, I don't think that there is a better approach. I think that it all depends on the person that you're dealing with. Um, any past history you have with this person in their addiction, I know that sometimes family members just get fed up with this, you know? Uh, it's, and understandably so, it's incredibly difficult and it's something that is so hard for family and friends to watch the addict go through. And it wasn't until I was on the other side of that that I saw all of that pain that I put my family and my friends 
through um, people that I had pushed away in my life that really cared about me. I didn't realize how much my addictions and my choices affected them. I thought that my addiction was a very selfish disease and that it only affected me and me alone. But coming out of that and being on the other side and then having friends die and watching friends constantly relapse, I realized that it takes an emotional toll on everyone involved. So I can't even imagine what it would be like to watch like family go through it. And I mean, I do know what it's like to watch family go through this disease, but um, in particular, if you have a thought or feeling that someone might have relapsed and you're wondering how to confront them, my best advice is to just ask. I mean, like, hey, are you loaded right now? Have you relapsed? Just be very upfront and forward and to the point and don't beat around the bush and just ask straight up. I mean, and, and you have the right to do that, especially if you are holding that person accountable or if you know, you're know you supporting them in any way, they should want that accountability from people that love them. And it can be annoying when you're newly sober if people are constantly asking you about your recovery, but oh well. <laughs> so that's what I have to say about that. Do you ever get any cravings even though it's been five years? And for me, no. Actually, I had a very triggering experience happen for me literally last week. I had something very traumatic happen to me where a someone very close to me brought up a situation that brought me back to some childhood trauma that I had experienced. And for me, it brought up so much anxiety in me that I thought for just a moment, I said, it would be so nice to just have a drink to let all of this pain go. And I had to work through that. I had to call my husband. I had to cry and call my mom. I had to um, write in my journal. Um, but up until that point, which is very surprising for me because in the last five years, I have had absolutely no cravings whatsoever. I have never even thought like, oh, hey, wine might be nice. I've been in situations where I've had friends who drink casually and I've had the thought pass like, oh, I wonder if I could be one of those moms that could just like drink wine at play dates or something, but um, never like an actual craving. So that was a very interesting experience for me. I'm glad that I have not had that experience in early recovery and I'm glad that that happened to me with five, five years clean and not like five months or something like that because I feel like that would have been a very different outcome. Um, but luckily I have been blessed with the tools in my toolkit to work through these things. And that experience let me know that there is some emotional baggage there and some resentments that I'm holding on to that I just need to work through. And that honestly just pushes me into a better direction because I know the steps that I need to take to heal that part of myself. And healing, internal healing and internal self-love and internal forgiveness is something that takes years to fix, so it's not a quick fix. It's just something that you have to be able to recognize within yourself and you have to know what are the steps and what are the things I need to do to make myself feel better enough to get through this next moment without a drink or a drug. Did you use a 12 step program or go cold turkey? I'm newer to your channel slash page. Um, I did use a 12 step program. I went to a residential all women's facility 28 day program. And before that I had went through a seven day detox facility and I did utilize uh, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous as to get me through um, my recovery. I have worked a round of steps two and a half times um, and I have never, actually sponsored anyone or gone past that. So I guess I, I guess I can't say I've worked the entire round of steps essentially, but a lot of my foundational principles and beliefs in recovery are based on the 12 step program, which actually I feel works really well for me because I also identify as a Christian. I believe in God and I feel like a lot of those principles are based um, synonymously with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and being a Christian. Um, a lot of their beliefs and traditions and things like that are just very in alignment with what I already believed. So it was easy for me to adopt and take on. Did you do any taper down? So um, I went through a hospital for a detox and I wanna talk about this because I did not stop cold turkey. Anytime I had tried to stop cold turkey before, I got incredibly sick and I would not recommend that, especially if you're someone who's struggling with alcohol addiction um, because with alcohol withdrawals, you can actually die from that. So I would never recommend somebody specifically who's going through an alcohol 
addiction to withdraw on their own um, because that can be dangerous. I would definitely recommend reaching out to your insurance if you have it or your local hospitals and getting information on a medically safe um, detox. And so I did go to a detox facility um, at a hospital here in Washington and I was uh, given the first 36 hours of my stay because I had checked in and it was actually the day before Thanksgiving So the first 36 hours I was there I did not get any tape down and I was extremely Violently sick and it was the worst thing ever and probably something that I needed to go through being locked up and just ill um, And then after that I was given a four-day suboxone taper down which is um, Suboxone is a drug that you can use to help wean yourself off of opiates or heroin or um, other drugs like that. So Suboxone is a drug that you can use to taper off of opiates. So uh, done properly and with the help of a doctor, you can just use a taper for detox specifically. And that's what I did. And that really helped me get through detox without wanting to like crawl out of my own skin. What do you and your husband do on Friday nights for fun? We are six months sober now, but Friday nights are hard. Honest to God, we have two kids ages four and under now. And our idea of fun Friday nights is like going to bed early. I know it sounds boring and I don't have an answer for this. That sounds more exciting and upbeat. We're both over 30. We have two small kids. We work hard and I think that our idea of fun is literally just hanging out on a couch, spending time with each other and just relaxing at home. We love to get takeout if we can or go and eat from time to time. Right now date night is not like a huge priority for us. It's something that we do need to work into our routines but where we are right now in this stage of life with kids so young and just with so much responsibility, it's been really hard for us. So navigating fun in recovery is not really something that I had to work through because as soon as I got into recovery, I was pregnant basically. If you've watched my other video, then you know that I got pregnant pretty early in recovery, about three months sober. So a lot of my recovery, like I didn't have to focus on having fun because I had to focus and shift my attention on mothering a child and it's just kind of followed me and now that I'm 30 I feel like what's fun fun for me is sleep you know so I'm sorry I don't have like a super fun question for or super fun answer for that but I do know a lot of my friends in recovery that seem to have like a ton of fun I mean they get together they have game nights they go to late night meetings they go out to eat I know that when we were in early recovery and we would go to like later night meetings I would always try to go out to eat or go out to dinner um, go out for coffee with the other people I would get myself socially interacting with other women in recovery um, and I would do sober gatherings. A lot of times um, AA programs will have like sober events when we're not in the midst of a pandemic obviously and like resolve to online meetings. Um, but go to a Friday night Zoom AA meeting or something and see what kind of options they have in the present moment. And then when we are back into the real world, there are a ton of fun like sober events that I know they host all the time for young people, young couples, young people who are single, that kind of thing. So there was always stuff like that going on. My family is recovering and refuses to get treatment. Thinks church is enough. What are my thoughts? Uh, I don't like to judge people and make assumptions on their ability to get clean and sober without the use of treatment. I, I know for myself personally, treatment was something that I needed because I needed to check out of life. I needed to get away from my people, places, and things that kept me stuck in my addiction. But that's not to say that that's the only way because I do know people who got clean and sober going through different church ministries and um, things like that. I, I, I know plenty of people actually who have gotten clean and sober that way uh, and their stories are miraculous and you know they really have the hand of God on them and I feel like it's totally possible and unfortunately there's just not a real way of knowing. Um, one of the things with recovery is you kind of have to let the addict figure out what's going to work for them and it's it's hard because you want to have your hand in it so much but they have to take a huge chunk of responsibility for their recovery my battery's dying so i'm going to change that really quick
Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. I clearly didn't plan my battery life long enough. I'm only 21 minutes into recording, so I don't want this to be super long, but I feel like I have to give pretty lengthy answers. These are some really good questions, so I'm really appreciative of those that asked questions. A lot of people asked about advice on how to get family members clean, and that kind of goes into what I just said. A lot of times you have to kind of let the addict be the driving force in their own recovery. I had gone to treatment four times and I had been in countless different programs to help me get sober and those were all a force of hand from either like my family, my parents, um, or whoever I was like dating at the time. Um, and it wasn't until I made the decision to get sober for me and honest to God, I can't tell you the exact reason why I stayed clean and sober this time. I made a lot of decisions in early recovery in 2015 when I first got clean and sober based simply on the fact that I didn't know if I was going to stay sober. In case with my son, um, my son going to live with his dad. That decision was made because I wasn't sure where my life was heading. I was unemployed, I was living in a transitional house, newly sober, and I didn't quite know what was going to happen to me. But some things that really did help change and shift my path and where I was going. I'm sorry if this is so bright. So some of the things that really helped shift my path I'd say is I had to change the people places and things so for me I'm from Tacoma Washington um, I can never go back there to live uh, it just is what it is there's too many negative memories associated with almost every neighborhood and area in the entire city I know too many people um, there's just there's a negative energy there for me that I don't feel comfortable living in. Even now, five years out, I, I think all the time, like if I were to ever move anywhere, I'd probably be out of state because I just can't go back home. Um, I had to change a lot of my friendships for a while. I am still friends with some of the people that I know from back then, um, but it's just in a different way now. And they all are very aware that I am in recovery and that my life is different. And um, yeah, and then some people who who was associated with, you know, I had to completely cut off. So it's very important that you change your environment if you can. I know that that's a lot harder if you're dealing with someone who has like an entire family or like children and, um, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of majority of my alcoholism and addictions through my teenage years and younger 20s where I didn't have so much keeping me grounded in that location so it was a lot easier for me to uproot my life essentially and move away um, which i know not everyone has the option to do but as far as helping family members get clean and sober you can only do so much what i would recommend for you is to look into al-anon which is a program that's similar to a 12-step program but it's for the family and children and spouses of the addict to go and get help either with like their enabling or just learning how to deal with people in addiction because there is a right and healthy way and there is a wrong and toxic way and a lot of times as family members of addicts it's like I feel like we we push towards being enabling and very toxic and we just don't go about it the correct way and it's because you love that person so much you want them to get it right so badly that you just end up doing it in a way that's not helpful and not beneficial to them. So I would definitely recommend anyone looking into Al-Anon. I will have links to all of these resources that I'm talking about down below in the description box. I really want that to be a place of value and good resources for you guys. So make sure that you're checking down in the description box for anything that I'm talking about here that might be useful for you. I'll try and have links, websites, phone numbers, hotlines, anything you can think of um, down below in the description box. But as far as helping family, I wish there was I wish there was like the perfect one one fit answer that would help everyone but unfortunately that's just not the case and unfortunately a lot of times the addict will have to be the one to make the decision no matter what a family member says or does. Um, you're talking to someone who lost custody of her child. Um, we do a lot of things that um, when you're clean and sober you regret but when you're fogged by addiction and alcoholism, you just can't see it straightly. You can't see it straight. And 
I don't know any other way to say it than to say it like that. There's just some things that you wish you could change when you finally do get sober that you couldn't see properly when you were in addiction because addiction takes over every proper thought process in your mind. And that's hard for loved ones and family members to hear um, because that's not the answer that we want. We want the, what can I do to fix it? We want to fix. Um, and unfortunately, this just isn't the kind of situation where there's just like a, oh, here's a method. Here's a three-step method on how you can fix this person's life. Unfortunately, that's just not how it works. And it's sad. It is. Um, but the more help that you can get for yourself and the more education you can give yourself on how you can react to your addict, the happier you'll be, the more helpful you'll be, and the the more boundaries you'll have set in place, which will make moving forward look a lot better for you. What was the most important change you had to make to leave your old lifestyle? Um, for me, it was letting go of, of old people and old ideas. So for me, when I got clean and sober, I deleted all my old social media. Well, I didn't delete it. I still have my, I still have access to my old Facebook, but I don't ever log in. I completely got rid of my old Facebook and Instagram and I started anew. I changed my cell phone number and I got a new phone number and a new phone. Um, those were just some things that I did along with, like I said, I did not go back home when I got out of treatment. I, I went into a transitional housing um, so that I didn't have to go home. So I literally changed changed everything about my old lifestyle. I didn't um, go back to the old city. I had a new phone, so I didn't have access to any of my old contacts in my phone. I actually deleted all of my dealer's contacts while I was in treatment um, with the help of a counselor who walked me through that. Uh, I had to get rid of all my social media because I just had too many people. It was just too hard to go through one by one, so I just got rid of it completely, started a whole new page. Um, I think what was the most important thing? Everything. I had to change everything about who I was and what I believed and what I wanted in order to make this lifestyle successful for me. What part of your life has changed the most since you started your recovery and what has changed the least? So for me, I think what's changed the most is my perspective on things and my ability to read the room. Because I've gone through so much in life, I have a pretty unique perspective on when people behave a certain way or when people do certain things. I'm able to um, read into people's actions and behaviors and just kind of view them from a different perspective. So instead of getting angry right off the bat, I'm able to kind of look at them and say, oh, well, this person's probably doing this because of this. Call it a little bit more like intuition. I feel like I just have a better, in tune sense of intuition and being able to read and resonate with people on different things. I feel like that's something that's really improved for me with recovery because before I was very selfish, self-centered. I did not care about other people. I was not able to really connect with other people on a deeper level because I had the addiction blocking my ability to really be vulnerable and connect with people. That's something that I think has changed the most and something that has been the most impactful for me. I love being able to truly deeply connect with someone and being able to kind of I, I say read the room because i'm able to like read what's going on in in the community or you know within my tribe of people on my social media platforms and i know like okay maybe it's not the best time to talk about this because of the way that everyone is feeling about this circumstance i feel like that's kind of um, something that I didn't have before that I have now that I love and cherish and what has changed the least I think just my sense of humor and the fact that I was you know funny and crazy and wild I'm still funny and crazy and wild is just toned down just a little bit and I don't know if that's so much from recovery or if it's from turning 30 and becoming a mom of three like any of those things could have taken me out from, you know, the depth in which I was wild and crazy. But a lot of my friends, even friends that knew me back in high school and stuff will still say, I'm just as wild and crazy and fun and like dancing around on social media and stuff. Like that's just my thing. That's how I am. That's my personality. That's how I've always been. So yeah, my phone just died. So now I need a charger. This has literally been the most hot mess q and I think I have ever done. My phone's died twice, my batteries died. I am just not on point right now, you guys. You're lucky I have a bra on, okay? Because, uh, child, <laughs> can't catch a break. 
how do you set boundaries with friends? Um, all of my friends know that I'm in recovery or most of them do. Like I said, I'm very open about it and uh, I never feel pressured by any friends or coworkers or anything like that to drink um, or anything, if that's what you mean. So as far as setting boundaries go, if you're someone who is used to going out and having happy hour with your coworkers after work or having mimosas at brunch with your girlfriends, I think setting boundaries is as simple as, hey, I'm not drinking anymore because I needed to make a healthy lifestyle change. You don't even have to go into any more depth than that, but just making it very clear cut, no beating around the bush, just I'm not drinking anymore, so I would still maybe love to see you guys but just not in that environment where we're going to be having mimosas at brunch like maybe we can go for a walk or we can go to the movies or something else um, obviously it's a lot harder right now with the pandemic being able to go out and do anything but you get my drift as a spouse of an addict sometimes i feel like i am the root of the issues does your husband ever feel like that? Um, no, because me and my husband are actually both in recovery and that is a huge, um, I think, plus for me is the fact that we're both in recovery. I don't know what it would be like to date someone or be married to someone who is considered a normie or like someone who can like drink alcohol normally. Um, I have no idea what that would be like and I feel like that would be an added element of challenge to me if I had to live with someone who could just drink normally and didn't understand my struggle. But because we have that, um, that unity in this one area of life, I feel like it not only makes us stronger, um, but we are able to recognize within, e within each other, like, hey, you should probably like call the therapist and like go make an appointment, or like you should probably like go and call a friend or go and do a reading or sit down and pray. Like my husband asks me all the time, like, have you prayed today? Like, because we know enough about each other and enough about our behaviors and when we're acting out, um, that we need to do certain things to get back in alignment with who we want to be and how we want to show up. So, um, and as far as you being the root of the issues, I don't believe that any one person can be the root of anyone's issues. And if they are, I think that you need to seriously take a look at maybe doing some couples counseling. Even for me and Taylor, we do couples counseling and it can be beneficial for so many different relationship issues, maybe even not like issues, but just, I think everyone should do couples counseling. It just is what it is. That's just what I believe. I think it's beneficial for everyone, even if you're not having problems, like just just go get a couples counselor, okay? Thank me later. How many times did you relapse before you finally got clean? Um, a ton of times, a gang of times, plenty of times. How many times did I relapse? Five times, 10 times, 20 times. Um, I cannot stay clean and sober for the life of me. Um, I started drinking alcohol when I was 12 years old and smoking weed shortly after, and it was just a whirlwind. Um, I never had personal times during my teen or teenage years where I would say like, oh, I'm gonna try and stop it. I would say like, oh, I'm gonna try and not black out at this party, and I wasn't able to do that. And then I would get clean for little stints of time because I would get in trouble or something, and I was not able to stay clean and sober. So again, I have an entire video which goes into depth about my personal history and use with alcohol uh, and drugs in my other video. So please make sure that you go and check that out because it gives a lot of detail about my own personal backstory. Um, when it comes to going to a facility, how do you know which one is best for someone? Um, this one is kind of interesting. I had gone to a few different types or styles of treatment facilities. I, I don't think that you necessarily need to look too much into like, is this specific program going to mesh with this one person's personality or anything like that? Um, I know for me, I did really well at an all women's facility and that's because I had that added layer of being a woman and really liking relationships with men to fill that God-shaped hole that I was talking about earlier. So going to an all women's facility really helped take away that add that extra um, temptation of being in treatment. Like with men, I, I had to actually focus on myself and on my program as opposed to focusing on some Joe Schmo in treatment because I had done that before. So um, call your insurance company, see what treatment centers are available for your insurance. That's where I always started with like, what can I afford and what's available for insurance purposes? Like where can I go? Um, but as far as like the mission behind the specific facility and how well their like programs are gonna mesh with like any one person, I never really looked into that too deeply and I had gone to plenty of different treatment facilities. Um, but if you are interested, if you're like a woman and you have 
history of like trauma or abuse with men, maybe looking at an all women's facility or like a youth only facility or a men's only facility or um, a dual diagnosis facility where you can tackle your addictions and your mental health issues at one time. Those are really popular. Uh, you can look into things like that. But as far as like, am I gonna vibe with the vibes in here? I don't really think that that is as crucial of a detail to be looking at personally. What has helped you the most in your recovery? Um, having my daughter on my sober date is my saving grace. And I know that that seems kind of shallow because we really can't depend on another person to be our source of strength in recovery, but having my daughter on my one year sober birthday was not only the best gift I could have ever been given in recovery, but it was the best gift God could have ever given me to keep my will and determination on staying sober. The fact that we have that interconnected date has really helped me so much navigate this journey of recovery because no matter what, I feel like I can't let go of my date. I will bear tooth and nail clenched fists to keep my recovery because I owe it to my daughter. This little girl came into my life unexpectedly. She saved my life. Sorry, I'm not gonna cry. I'm emotional because my daughter turns four tomorrow and I have five years and um, she doesn't even know that she saved my life, literally. Um, I don't know if I'd still be sober if I don't, if I didn't have her. I don't know, but yeah, my daughter definitely helped me the most. Word of advice for those who are struggling with recovery. Um, don't give up, don't quit on a bad day. Keep fighting the good fight, turn it over. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. Don't give up believing in yourself. You're worth it. Your struggles are worth it. You're worth the fight. You deserve more. There's a life out there more unimaginable than you could ever dream up if you would just give this an honest shot. You don't have to die today. Those are just some things that popped right up to me um, as far as words of like wisdom, just don't give up trying, like keep fighting, like you're worth it. You are worth it. You're meant to be here. Your story is meant to change someone's life. The fact that you're still alive and you're struggling with alcoholism or drug addiction is a testimony within itself because so many of us don't make it out. So many people die every day from this disease and the numbers are rising with quarantine and with having to be alone with nothing but ourselves and our thoughts and our vices. Alcohol uh, sales have spiked. I mean, people, and I can only imagine people in the drug businesses are thriving right now with people having nothing to, to hold on to. Um, so, you know, there's hope out there. There's hope and there's a life for you out there. If you're struggling, just ask for help. Like do the next best thing, reach out to me. I'm, my inbox is always open to chat with a fellow addict or a person seeking recovery. Is your first son with his dad because of your past addiction? Yes and no. This is very much so like a difficult question for me to answer because I feel like had I had the chance to go back in time when we were in the process of making the decision of where my son would go, I would have chosen differently had I had the resources at that time to keep him. But I was in such a a hard place. Um, I was newly sober. Um, my son had been living with my parents and his dad was nowhere around because his dad was not actively in his life. He was not supporting him in any way, shape or form. He basically was gone from the time he was two months old and was living in Africa and did not know anything about my struggles with addiction because he wasn't around. He was not an active parent. And the way that he pitched it to me at the time was, hey, you know, you're living in like transitional house, you're doing whatever it is you're doing to get well. Like I have a wife, um, my other kids here, a house, you know, I have all of these things and like your parents are old. Um, he should have like a solid place with, with one of his parents. And I completely agreed with that wholeheartedly. And I was like, yeah, you know, because if I can't be there and you know, you're doing really well, of course, you know, that, that makes sense. Um, had I have known the hell he was gonna put me through after the fact, or how hard it was gonna be, or how difficult it was gonna be, or the fact that I would have this very beautiful life today if I would have just waited like 
three months to make a decision instead of having my hand forced by him at the time circumstances would have been different but yes my son does live with his dad in um across across the nation basically um he lives very far away and i don't get to see him very often because it's very far away we live on opposite ends of the nation um so yeah it's it's a difficult um it's a difficult situation and it's a difficult scenario that we were put in and had I have known that things would be the way that they are now, I would have made different decisions then. But at the time, I felt like I was making the best decision I could have been making and I stand by that. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. We live and we learn and sometimes there are repercussions for decisions that we made and, and that is a repercussion of where my life was at at the time. Had I not been in that position where I didn't have anything, I wouldn't have had to make that choice and unfortunately I did. So I have to take responsibility for that and when my son is older, I hope that we are able to have conversation and be open about anything and in the meantime i'm just going to keep on fighting for my visits keep on fighting for relationship and keep on fighting the good fight because he deserves to have his mother in his life and he deserves to have his father in his life and he deserves to you know he deserves to be happy wherever he chooses to be so i have to be okay with that and i have to be ready to have the conversation when the time arises so anywho that answers all of my questions that I had. I, I have a few more, but most of them are pretty similar. So I thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. Um, if you have not already, please hit the thumbs up button. Please subscribe and hit the little bell notification so that you don't miss any videos from me. I will catch you guys in my next video. I post videos here weekly. So I hope that y'all like this. Comment down below and let me know what is the part of this questionnaire or what stuck out with you the most during this. And if anything was helpful to you, please let me know in the comments and I will chat with you guys in the next video. Bye.